Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like us to um, just take a moment to pray. I'm going to just put a couple things out there for you, and, and if we could pray about them together, and then if you could carry them this week, I'd really appreciate that. We have um, two families that are going through some really deep waters, and we're a body, and we're told to carry each other's burdens and to pray, so I just want to bring them before you. Um, Ed and Lisa Dreesen, some of you know Ed and Lisa, they have... Uh, four kids, three here and one in heaven. Uh, Erica, their 18-year-old daughter, went to heaven this last week. And uh, she had a very difficult um, battle with cancer. And this week she went to be with the Lord. And I know Ed and Lisa would really value your prayers. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult time, as you can well imagine. And uh, the service will be here on Thursday at 2 o'clock. So if you could remember the family and, and just pray that God's presence would be so powerful here. Um, somehow we know that um, the death of one of God's people is never in vain but for those that have to keep walking here it's just hard and it hurts and then um, some of you know Mark and Sarah Mahood they've come here for a good number of years they have a little grandson named Isaac Isaac is six months old and he's he was born with his heart on the wrong side and he's had a series of operations and he goes up to Stollery Hospital in Edmonton uh, this Wednesday for another second series of operations the little boy um, on his heart and they would like prayer um, apart from God intervening in his name is Isaac Isaac's life uh, there's very little hope humanly speaking but we have a God that spared an Isaac before and spared him to live a long and productive life and that's what we're praying for this little Isaac as well so I want to take a moment to pray and if you could just, during the week, as you remember these people, um, lift them up. Even if you don't remember their names, just say, Lord, that family that lost a daughter, the Lord knows who they are, and, and I know they'd really appreciate it, so let's pray. Father, tonight we thank you that your door is wide open because of the work of Jesus. You've invited us to come into your presence. You've said that you will actually uh, stop and bend down and listen to all the words that we speak. We want to talk to you tonight about some of your friends who are also our friends. Father, we pray for Ed and Lisa and for their family. So they're going through a really um, dark and, and deep time, the loss of Erica. Father, I know that they trust you, and, and so as their, their friends and family, we pray for them that their faith wouldn't fail through all of this. We pray that somehow that they would be able to rest in the fact that you're good and that somehow uh, Erica's death will not be in vain. Father, I, I don't know how it feels, and I'm sure a lot of people here have never experienced what they experienced, but you do because you lost your son, and you watched him die. And so I pray with that great comfort that you have that you would comfort Ed and Lisa and their children. And I pray Thursday that there'd be an unmistakable sense of your presence here. I pray, Father, that everybody that walks in here would know that there's hope. There's living hope. And we think of uh, Mark and Sarah and their kids and, and uh, this little baby Isaac, Father. It's, he's going through a, another series of operations that a little boy you wouldn't think should ever have to go through. And so we pray for him. We pray on Wednesday the doctors would be given great wisdom and skill, and we pray for his life. Not only for his life, but we pray that um, as you did many thousands of years ago, you would spare another Isaac, and that this little Isaac would grow up to be a man after your own heart. And so, Father, we pray for him. We pray for the family that they'd have just a sense of your presence and your peace as they go up to Edmonton and, and have to wait through this whole operation. And I pray you'd bring them to our mind this week as they need prayer. And at the right time, you'd put them on our hearts. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, the last couple of weeks and tonight, we've been talking about, for lack of a better term, uh, the vision that we have as a church. What that means to us is basically this. We, we take seriously the Great Commission. When Jesus went back to heaven, he said to all his followers, you go out into all the world and you make disciples, you baptize them and teach them everything that I've taught you. And that was handed down to every follower of Jesus, every group of Christians, everywhere. And our statement of mission or vision is our best way of applying that right here in central Alberta. And so we like to say often here that we want to give everyone in central Alberta an opportunity to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and by following him together, compassionately impact our world. And where we've come so far, the first week we looked at getting ready 
to share the good news about Jesus. Last week, I tried to make the point that there isn't anybody anywhere that Jesus isn't good news for. And tonight, I'd just like to talk to you for a few minutes about how to tell our friends about Jesus. And that's not as easy as it might seem. I mean, if you've tried, you'll know that. But I think we need to think through together a little bit about how to talk to our friends, family, people we work with, about the Jesus that we know and worship and follow. Let me just put up on the screen two verses that I want to start with. Uh, one from the New Testament, one from the Old. This one, if you've been in church long, you might be familiar with it. It says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. In other words, for everybody. And then the second one is from the book of 1 Kings, and it comes in a list of names. Uh, usually we skip over those, our eyes glaze over, and we have to read that. Um, it's a list of names that, of, of great men, mighty men, that God surrounded David with to make David famous. And one of those groups of men was men of Issachar. And it says about them, just an intriguing little statement. They understood the times, and they knew what Israel should do. These men of Issachar, they understood the times, and they knew what Israel should do. Now, if you take those two scriptures together and apply them to what we're thinking about tonight, about the gospel, I, I would make two statements about them. First, this. Romans 1.16 would say that the gospel is transcultural. In other words, it's for everyone everywhere at, in all time. Um, the gospel is the good news about Jesus, and really, it, it, there's no other good news in the world like that. It's for everybody, all people, whether you live here or South America or Africa, whether you live now or whether you live 100 years from now, the gospel is transcultural for everybody. But the second statement, when we talk about men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do, I would say that that means that the gospel is encultured, E-N, cultured, or embedded in culture. What that means is that we have to think of different ways and methods of sharing the gospel in different cultures and at different times. Uh, it's the same gospel, but it takes a lot of wisdom and skill to know how to share the gospel because it's embedded in culture. In fact, even, even the gospel that we read, the, the Bible that we read, it's embedded in culture. And unless you know something about the culture, it's really difficult to make sense of the Bible. I mean, for example, when it talks about God, what does it say about God? He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So if I want to know some things about God, I'm going to have to know some things about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When Jesus comes on the scene, his friend John, or cousin John the Baptist looks at him and says, Behold the Lamb of God. Like, what's that? Looks like a person to me. But that was embedded in a culture where lambs were frequently sacrificed for sin. And if you didn't know that, you would make no sense out of what John the Baptist said, where Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, or I give my life as a ransom for many. What's that all about? You got to understand the culture. Or I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So the, the um, thinking uh, is that to understand the gospel well, we have to be able to understand the culture of the Bible, but, but also where we, we present it and talk about it, we talk about it to people embedded in a culture. And we have to understand their culture and how to communicate to them if we're going to be effective communicators of the good news about Jesus. Um, how you read the Bible, actually, and what lens you put on is really important because I say it's so um, culturally embedded, all this stuff. I'll give you an example. Of, um, if I was talking to you about the woman at the well, you, you may remember this story about Jesus, dog tired and thirsty, goes to a well and a woman comes up. And um, she's surprised to see him, embarrassed to see him, didn't, didn't want to meet a man there. And Jesus engages her in conversation and uh, finds out that um, she's come to draw water. And he talks to her about living water. You know the story if you've heard it before. And if not, uh, that's the way it goes. But in the process of the conversation, he makes this statement to her. You have had five husbands. And now you're living with a man and he's not your husband. What do you assume about that? From... Our culture, looking through our lenses, what we would assume is she's a sinner. She's been married, divorced, married, divorced, married, divorced, married, divorced, married, divorced. Now she's just living with a guy. And it's easy to stamp her sinner. But what if you were from a different culture in our world and you heard that story for the first time? What would your assumption be? It might, you most likely would assume that she's been abandoned by five men, one after another. You might assume that now she lives under another man's roof for protection and this man won't even honor her by marrying her. 
And you would stand for his sinned against, not sinner. See, it all depends what glasses you put on. There's absolutely nothing in that text in John 4 that would suggest she's a sinner or sinned against. We have to make those decisions based on our culture and the culture that um, she would be in. So that's, culture is very, very important. And when you come to the Bible and you examine the ways that Jesus and his friends presented the gospel, it, 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 they used a lot of different methods, a lot of different methods. I mean, Nicodemus, you got to be born again. And then Jesus meets, meets a rich young guy and he says, give away all your money and come and follow me. And then this story about the, the woman at the well. Um, you know, Jesus didn't talk to her about, he didn't talk about sin or repentance or hell. He just, in fact, what he really just said was, what are you looking for? Because what you're looking for, I have. Do you want it? You can have it. Um, you know, I used to, when I was, well, many, many years ago, um, they used to ask me to speak at teens camps. And um, I remember speaking at one. Why did you laugh at that? Somebody laughed. <laughs> Somebody laughed. <laughs> I was young once. And um, I was at a camp called Morning Star Bible Camp up in the Okanagan, West Kelowna. And, um, you know, after the first, first talk I gave, I was speaking about 10 or 15 times that week, the first talk, the, the, somebody went back and talked to the camp board and said, this guy didn't talk about sin or repentance or heaven or hell. The next time I got up, like the whole board's back there and they're sitting like this. And they're waiting for the right words so that they'll know I've shared the gospel. And apparently I didn't use them because I got a letter quickly that said, thank you for your service and uh, toodaloo kind of thing. I didn't use the right terminology. But, I, but then I went back to the Bible and I said, well, how did Jesus present? You know, he never mentioned sin to the woman at the well. Never meant, meant, mentioned repentance. There's times when he, when he certainly indicated that. But he, my point is that he, he, would, he would be very aware of what this person was looking for and what doors the Holy Spirit was opening. And he'd walk in on that track. And I think it's really important for us to develop that kind of sensitivity of the Holy Spirit because there's different ways of sharing the good news. Another example would be I, if I wanted to sell my car and um, somebody came and, and they were an, um, let's say they were an engineer and they wanted to buy my car. You know, when I, when I, when I talk to them, I might promote my car by giving the guy the engine specs, the horsepower, uh, the eight-speed transmission. I, he would maybe be intrigued by all that. But let's say the person wanting to buy my car was, um, was an architect. And I would tell them about how beautiful this car is and, and how it cut. If you're on the Coquihalla Highway going the speed limit, it's it, amazing the way it would just cut through the air. Or if the person coming to me wanting to buy my car was a race car driver, well, they wouldn't come to me, but if they did, um, I would tell them something about the handling and um, the performance of this car. But if a sales rep came, I'd probably promote it by showing him the trunk because it's big enough to put a ton of stuff in. Or if it was a mom with children, I talk about the safety features. Same car, trying to sell the car, but different approach depending on who comes. The gospel is a little bit like that. Uh, there's not necessarily one size fits all. It is the gospel, the good news about Jesus, but how we present it depends on the culture and the world that we live in or we're presenting it in and where those particular people are at. So um, what I'd like to do just for a couple minutes, I jotted this down this week in a, in a quick moment over a cup of coffee, and so it's not anything profound. Some of it you already know, but I just want to just trace out really quickly, give you four or five points about the world that we live in, just so that we're all aware of some of the challenges we're up against when we promote the gospel, when we share the good news about Jesus. You can add to this list. You can make your own probably better than mine, but, but this is the list I came up with when I just thought for a few minutes about the world we live in. It's a world where knowledge is made, not discovered. Um, in other words, knowledge and truth are personal. It's my truth and it's your truth. Um, I have mine and you have yours. You're not necessarily right and I'm not necessarily wrong. Uh, another thing I wrote down is that there's no universal truth. There's no, there's no uh, what I mean by that is no meta narrative in our world. There's no grand unifying story that explains everything. Uh, no absolutes. And so as Christians, we come along and if the first thing we say is, let me tell you the big story about everything, I mean, they're going to glaze over because in the world we live in, there's no meta narrative. There's no big story that explains everything. Um, there's a deep mistrust of organized religion, government, and other forms of established authority. 
driving in at six o'clock this morning, so I put the CBC News on in my car, and I heard that in Hong Kong, as they were sharing the news, uh, violence had erupted on the streets again, and it was a disaster. So there's this, there's this pushback against organized government, but it's religion, and often it's organized authority of any kind. There's just a mistrust of that. And so we say, come to our beautiful big new building, and they just, uh, pff, you know, sorry. Um, that's the problem, the challenge that we have to get through and around. Um, tolerance is the highest moral good, and you know that. Um, here's the one that I find the greatest challenge about the world we live in, and that is that ethics have become a barrier to belief in the gospel. Ethics have become a barrier to belief in the gospel. When our non-Christian friends think of Christians or Christianity, they don't think of good news. They don't think of salvation. They don't think of forgiveness, restoration, justice, mercy, or love. Instead, when they think of Christians or Christianity, they think hate, fear, power, and violence. And so ethics, in a lot of ways, becomes a barrier um, to belief in the gospel. They see their own views as the ethical stance uh, because they're seeking to empower, to liberate, to restore justice to the marginalized and oppressed. And uh, in our world, Christians are viewed as the oppressors and haters who... Um, uh, you know, they, they oppress and they keep people down. And it's the non-Christians that, that traffic in the areas of love, justice, and mercy. That's the way they see it. And that's a big challenge for us to get through and get over to communicate the gospel effectively in this world. And so I just I thought about some of those challenges when I was thinking about tonight. And I thought, so how do we share the good news about Jesus? And I, I don't have any um, brilliant answers. I have some suggestions for you tonight, about five of them. Just put them up on the screen, and I'll just walk through them with you, because I think they're, they're valid, and they're valid ways to share the good news about Jesus in our culture. The first word is a buzzword, authenticity, but still a good word. And what I mean by authenticity is that um, the question today is not, is it true? And that's not, not the question. The question is, is it real in your life? That's authenticity. Not, nobody's interested really in, is it true? They, they want to know if it's real in your life. It's the old walk the talk. Uh, I know that we can have to communicate the good news with words, and we'll get to that. But, but if we don't communicate it through our life, if we don't realize that we're part of the message, then we're hooped before we ever begin. And there are some cultures and places and some people you know that you have no chance with words until they know that it works in your life. And I thought, is that true in the Bible? And then I remember, yes, it is. There was a city that Paul wanted to go into to plant a church called Thessalonica. And um, words weren't cutting it really well. So th listen to what Paul says about how the gospel came to Thessalonica. Um, it goes like this. Do we have that on the screen? No, we don't. I'll find it. Talk among yourselves. Um, oh, here it is. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he's chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. Paul says when the gospel came to Thessalonica, it wasn't simply with words, but it was with power, with the Holy Spirit, and it came because you watched how we lived and you saw it in our lives first. Um, that's huge, I think, in the world that we live in today. Um, the gospel is something we communicate with words, but not if there's no reality. People want to know if it works in your life. Can you put that um, screen up? where I, uh, I just, I want to show you what it was like when I was growing up, and actually what it was like right up until quite recently in terms of truth, belief, and practice. Um, the way we were taught was this is true, and if it's true, you should believe it. And if you believe it, now you got to live it. And most of us that were in church long, uh, that's the way it was. It's true, so you should, and that's the way you pre present the gospel. If it's true, believe it, and then live it. But I think it's better to look at it this way today. The Christian life is livable. If it's livable, then it's also believable. And if it's believable, it must be true. Um, that's a better approach, I think, in the world that we live in. Um, live it. Because if it's livable, somebody might think it's believable. And if they think it's believable, they just might think it's true. The second word on that list I had was hospitality. And we talked a little bit, opened the door a little bit on that last week. Um, teaching and preaching and speaking in contexts like this, and other contexts are, are, are important, I suppose. But um, hospitality demonstrates that the gospel is real 
authentic, believable, um, attractive, and actually livable. It's interesting, last night I drove home from Vancouver and got in, uh, and I was just kind of a vegetable, so I turned on the TV and flicking around, and I, I don't know where this channel was, I didn't know we had it, but I came across the channel, and it was the, the show that was on was called Billy Graham Classics. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I watched him speak in Tampa, Florida in 1972. And he had, you know, a suit and tie on, and, and they, it was very traditional. They sang hymns, and, and it was, I thought, man, and it was a good message, but a, a message for another generation. That would, that would be really hard to fly today. And I really like Billy Graham. You know, when I was a kid growing up, we had to sit and watch all his programs, and I got saved 16 times listening to him because every time I listened and they sang, um, just as thou art, I, I was in, I'm up, and I stood up in the family room. One time I touched the TV, and so actually last night I got saved another time, 17 times I've been saved by Billy Graham now, through Billy Graham. But, you know, I mean, that, that's, it was great the way God used that, um, but in this world, if we're not opening our homes to people where they can see the attractiveness and the livability of the good news of Jesus, there's not much hope. Uh, in fact, there's not much hope people are just going to walk into a building because we build it. If we build it, it doesn't mean they're going to come. Did you know that? They're not going to come just because we build it. Um, the door to our building is the door of our homes. And it's through our homes that people eventually end up hopefully worshiping with us. People have no idea what it's like to go to church. I have friends in West Vancouver, so when I'm out there, I like to visit them. They don't know nothing about anything Christian. They're still trying to get their head around what a pastor is. And so um, when I'm at their house, they try and get me to explain what I do, and I try and explain it. And I, I say, well, we do, like, and they say, what do, what do you do at church? And I say, well, we, we come together, and a bunch of people come, and they sing. People sing. Yeah, they all sing. It was, it was really incredible. Great band. We take money, and then we, um, <laughs> I usually leave that to the aside. Then I say, you know, we talk about the Bible. And, 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 and so she looked at me and said, so if you were living back in North Vancouver, where would you recommend we go to church? Because I wouldn't know when to go or what to do or what to wear. I said, you know what? I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend you go to church here. And they said, you're a pastor. I said, you know, but I wouldn't recommend you. Why would you just walk into a church? You don't know anybody. Um, you don't know what, you'd be really awkward. I said, why don't you live stream for a while? Why don't you just live stream our services and get to understand a little bit about what church is, who Jesus is, why it's important that we worship him, how we teach the Bible. So that when you walk, I said, I'll give you a recommendation. Uh, but when, when, when you're ready to walk in, at least you'll have a head start and know what you're doing. Most people like them just aren't going to walk into a church. And so opening our doors and um, being hospitable is a great safe environment to have good conversations around Jesus or whatever they're around. Um, you know, I thought of this um, earlier today. I thought, how, whenever, wherever, and however the, the kingdom manifests itself, it's always welcome. It's always welcome. Welcome is always the key word. Whenever, wherever, however the kingdom manifests itself, is always welcome. Uh, welcome is the word, and that should be the word in our homes. Hospitality is a great way to get started. Actually, it's the Jesus way when you think about it. If you read Luke, I mean, he is always eating and drinking with sinners, always on their turf, so much so that he was always accused of being a partier and being uh, eating and drinking with them. And in fact, remember when he, when he found Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was up a tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, come down. I, I'm going to come to your house for dinner tonight. A lot of evangelism that Jesus did was in the context of a home with a meal. Uh, with people that were known to be notorious sinners. And so he got, he got um, shot at a lot because of that. But that, that was a, we're just following in the footsteps of Jesus when we do that, when we open up our homes. So I want to, I wanna, again, um, over the next little while, we'll talk a lot about these, this idea of open homes, a lifestyle of following Jesus where we use our homes to, um, to uh, invite people to understand what it's like to actually know and live the Christian life in family. Testimony, um, this is where words come in a little bit, uh, the story of how we became Christians and how God continues to work in our lives. Uh, how did you become a Christian and a follower of Jesus? If somebody asked you for the reason, for the hope that you have, what would you say? Um, testimony is a great way to, to, to tell them about Jesus. Um, and I think that 
um, using stories is just builds on that a little bit. Um, stories are so, so important, uh, more important for a lot of people than facts. Um, stories like um, the story behind the story is what I'm thinking about. So maybe if the opportunity presents itself to say something like this, would you like to hear a story that explains my story? Would you like to hear a story that explains my story? Then tell them the story of Jesus. Tell them the story of Jesus. Don't assume they know anything about Jesus. I met a couple a number of years ago here, Sunday after Easter, I think it was, and um, they, had, they just decided they're going to go to church, and they, uh, they're way out of their element. And I said, why did you come back the next week? And they said, because, you know, we, we've never heard what we heard on Easter Sunday. We never knew who Jesus was. I never had any clue that Easter was about this Jesus rising from the dead. And they lived within five kilometers of this church all of their life. They'd never heard about Jesus rising from the dead. Don't assume that people know about Jesus. So a great, a great line is, would you like me to ex explain uh, the story that, that makes sense of my story? And, and just, you know, it, you can do that in the context of home a lot easier than you can anywhere else. Maybe in a coffee shop you can do that too. I don't know. Um, and then, and then, I didn't know how to put this last one, so I just put it this way. Use the whole gospel. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. And uh, it's the last point, but don't, don't just assume that I'm finished because I want to take five or ten minutes here. But um, I want to explain what I mean by the whole gospel. There's different ways of understanding the gospel and the way the gospel is portrayed in the New Testament. For example, uh, in the West, the way we were generally taught and the way a lot of us talk about the gospel today is what we would call, um, what I would call, a guilt-innocence culture. Uh, we lived in this world where you sinned and you broke God's laws, so you need to ask for his forgiveness. And that's true. That, that's true. But um, it doesn't always fly today the way it did then. We were given these, when we were um, young you know, high schoolers, uh, our youth pastor one day gave us these little booklets called, Have You Ever Heard of the Four Spiritual Laws? Have you ever heard of the Four Spiritual Laws? Probably not, but they, you'd have to be my vintage or maybe Fred's here to, to understand that. But the, these little booklets, and the first one was, um, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And there was four laws, and you'd sit down with people. Our church is very legalistic, so we used to say, God loves you and has a terrible plan for your wife. But anyway, that was just an aside. Um, but that's just because we didn't understand the New Testament well. Um, you know, even today, presenting the gospel, it's like, you guys are sinners. You've broken God's laws. You should repent, and they should. But they may not hear really what you're trying to say. I don't know. That's a Western approach. There's another culture, an honor-shame culture. And in this culture, honor comes by, by honoring your relationships. Shame comes when you bring dishonor on the relationship. So, for example, um, the Boston Marathon bomber, I can't even pronounce his last name, uh, the Chechen young man, um, 2013 was that? And I don't know if you remember, his uncle made a statement uh, that went viral, which is, you have brought shame on our whole family. It comes out of that shame honor culture. Brazil, 2014, lost the World Cup soccer, 7-1 to to Germany. Brazilian fans, we will be embarrassed anywhere we go in the world now. I'm ashamed, somebody said, to be a Brazilian. Shame honor type stuff. Um, and so... The gospel speaks to that too, and I'll show you that in a, in a couple of moments. And then there's the fear of power cultures, where um, there needs to be a power encounter. Uh, last week we looked at Acts 16, and where Paul uh, cast a demon out of this young slave girl. That's a, that's a power encounter. Um, I was speaking in Uganda at Bukwe, at one of our, our, our church in Bukwe, and I, I spoke on the prodigal son, and I invited people to come to Christ, and one lady came forward. And immediately she came forward to accept Christ. Just as we were singing the closing worship song, the elders, men and women, gathered around her, laid hands on her. And then they brought a, um, um, a blanket up. I didn't know that was for her. I realized later she had a, a dress on. But when they started praying for her, she started flailing all over the place. And um, I, I realized that they understood that she would have demons in her that needed to be cast out. And they just, they just took it for granted that there'd be a power encounter. And there was. And when they had done their work and she was peaceful, they invited the Holy Spirit to fill her and sent her on her way. And I thought that was, a, that was an amazing... They, they know their culture. Um, the first missionary retreat we ever did with our missionaries was in Romania. And we were in the mountains in a gypsy village. And at night, the power went out. 
and we got word that there was a 25-year-old couple, newly married, and the woman was terrified of the dark, would you come and pray? And we took a candle, and we went into their little hut, and we all laid hands on her and prayed that God would take care of the spirit of fear and bring her peace, and he did. So sometimes there needs to be a power encounter. Um, can, these are all three valid ways, by the way, of sharing the good news um, in the Bible. Um, the guilt innocence thing in the Bible, the best, I'm going to find you lots of verses around any of these, but in, in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions, and since transgressions means I've crossed the line, I've broken the law, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who's rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, it's by grace you've been saved. So Paul's saying, we've transgressed, we've crossed the line, we're guilty. Um, and because we're guilty, we're objects of God's wrath. And if we stayed in that position, we'd be in deep, deep trouble. But God, who is rich in mercy, sent Jesus Christ, who took on him all of our law breaking. And because he died for us, if we'll look to him and ask him for mercy, we can have it. Uh, there's many, many scriptures like that. But when you think about shame, honor, uh, there's many scriptures around that too. For example, one that comes to mind right away is the prodigal son. Um, what's going on there? Well, in the parable of the prodigal son... He's brought shame on his father, shame on his family, shame on the village. And the, um, what's going on in that parable is he's, the prodigal son is coming home, and, and this is the road home, and where the camera is back there is, is where the father is, and the father sees him coming and runs through the village to the son, braces him, gives him a new robe, then walks home. Now, the, in a Middle Eastern village, the, the, the roadway would be probably not much wider than this aisle here. And the problem for the son was it would be like walking a gauntlet because all the villagers would heap abuse on and shame on him because of what he's done. He's brought shame on the family and on the community. The father, knowing that, would run to him. The father would come with him and walk the gauntlet back with him. And nobody would, would dare to heap shame on him at that point. And by the way, just as an aside, um, it's a beautiful picture of repentance. In fact, all three parts to that parable are pictures of repentance. It says that right in it. The lamb that was lost, the shepherd found it, put it over his shoulders and walked home with it. How does that lamb repent? What Jesus is saying about repentance in Luke 15 is it is acceptance of being found. Repentance is acceptance of being found. Lamb didn't fight it. The son didn't fight it. Um, you never repent on your own. You never, never tell people you've got to repent of all this stuff and then you can come to Jesus. You never repent on your own. He always repents with you. He comes to you and he walks with you through all the stuff that you have to walk through to get back to the Father. All the stuff that needs cleaning up. All the stuff that needs turning away from. He is with you every step of that way, just like he was with the prodigal son. But that's shame on her. And then uh, you remember Romans chapter 10 and verse 11. Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Never be put to shame. And then there's that beautiful passage in 1 Peter. Um, can you put it on my screen? Because I can't remember it offhand. It's in 1 Peter 2. It says, for in scripture, it says, See, I lay in Zion, uh, a stone in Zion, chosen and precious, a cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Never be put to shame. There are multitudes of scriptures that deal with the issue of shame. Uh, and then the fear, um, lots of those too, but I'll just choose one in Colossians chapter um, 2, I think it is. You were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of sim simple nature, but God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. There was a power encounter at the cross where all the powers of darkness were made a spectacle of and the power was broken. So the power of sin, the power of death, the power of Satan um, was, was broken at the cross when Jesus died. His blood conquered everything. That's why his blood is enough for anybody. Um, 
So how do you share the gospel? Well, it requires sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Uh, who am I sharing the gospel with and what is their need? How do they see themselves? What do they see themselves in need of? Um, does the name Felicity Huffman mean anything to you? Felicity Huffman. I'm glad it doesn't to most of you. She is a, um, she's a star, a uh, falling star, really. Uh, desperate housewives. Desperate housewives. She was part of the college admission scandal. Do you remember that? Where certain uh, women were caught um, paying people to go over the entrance exam marks for their kids, changing the scores so they would be accepted into college. And I think her daughter was, had written the exams for Stanford. She paid $15,000 to get somebody to change the scores, and her daughter got in. She got caught. She was convicted. On Friday, she was sentenced. And her sentence on Friday was um, uh, 14 days in jail. I think she gets to pick. Pays to be a star. And uh, 250 community hours and a $30,000 fine. But do you know what she said in court when the sentence was handed down on Friday afternoon? Anybody besides me? I must have no life. I'm watching all this stuff. She looked at the judge and she said to the judge, I apologize for the shame that I brought on you. She looked at her daughters and I apologize for the shame that I brought on you and on our family. And she looked at her husband and I apologize for the shame that I have created by my actions. Now, if you were having coffee with Felicity Huffman and had an opportunity to share the good news, how would you share it? Would you say you've sinned? You've crossed the line? You're going to... I don't know if that would work. You know what I would say with her? I'd say, Felicity, I got some really good news for you. Shame does not have to be the last word. It doesn't have to be the last word. You know that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was publicly put to shame for all of us. And in fact, all of our shame was heaped on him. And if you call on him, the Bible says that anyone who trusts in him, Felicity, they'll never be put to shame. Shame will not be the final word. That's the path I would take with her. Um, now, how do you know what path to take? Well, as I said before, you, you have to say, stay so close to the Holy Spirit that you can hear him. We don't know what we're doing. We're all over our heads, but he's not. He knows the people that we're sharing with. Now, you stay as close to him as you can. You know, I, I hate dancing, and, and um, it's obvious if you, you see me. And um, in fact, in church, as I said to you before, I can... I can clap and I can sing, but I can't do both at the same time. And, you know, when I, when I go to a wedding with Ginny, and I go to a few weddings, we're always invited to the reception because nobody else can pray, so I have to pray. And so I pray, and, and we, we, go, we have a great meal, and, and I, I hear all the speeches that I've heard for 40 years. They all sound, somebody must download the same speech most of the time. But anyways, um, the, anyways then it comes time for the dance, and, and I have... Uh, Sadly, my schedule won't permit me to stay, so we make our exit at that point. Um, but sometimes when Ginny corrects me and says, sadly, our schedule will permit us to stay, um, we're stuck. And I find myself once in a while out there. I first make sure the floor is full of people so I'm not a public spectacle. But my way of dancing is this. I get as close to Ginny as I can. I hang on for dear life. And I watch her feet, and I just go where she goes. And I make it till the next wedding. Um, that's what I mean about the Holy Spirit. We have no idea what we're doing. We get as close to him as we can. And we keep, the Bible says, keep in step with him. We get so close that we can feel his nudges and hear his whispers so that we know how to share the eternal gospel to people that have no clue in a way that communicates properly to them that God loves them, that Jesus died for them. And if they want, there's a place waiting at the table for them. So we have to be in step with the Holy Spirit. You cannot do it without the Holy Spirit. His job is to lift up Jesus. His job is to draw people to Christ. My job is to listen to the Holy Spirit. Um, sh uh, you know, uh, there used to be an old line that, that, that witnessing, sharing Christ is just, is just sharing him in the power of the Holy Spirit and just leaving the results to God. That's, that's what it is. So I, I hope tonight that you'll, you'll take what fits and what doesn't. What I'm trying to say to you is this. 
that authentic, real lives that are attractive, homes that are open, uh, Christians that keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Those are the best ways to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read a poem to you. I like poems, and uh, so you'll have to endure that with me. I don't like dancing, but I like some poems, and um, I'll read it to you. And then I'm going to um, take the opportunity for anybody that's in that we'll dedicate our homes to Jesus, and I'll tell you how we'll do that in a moment. This poem maybe speaks to two groups of people. It really says this, that um, if you find yourself on the outside looking in, that you can be inside with the rest of us. You can have a place at God's table. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. There's a place for you there, and there's enough for you there. But for those of us that have received from him, it tells us that having received all that we want from him, living water, bread, wine, whatever, that we now go out and we share that with a broken world. It's just a poem called, And the Table Will Be Wide. It says, And the table will be wide, and the welcome will be wide, and the arms will open wide to gather us in, and our hearts will open wide to receive. And we will come as children who trust there is enough, and will come unhindered and free, and our aching will be met with bread, and our sorrow will be met with wine, and we'll open our hands to the feast without shame, and we'll turn toward each other without fear, and we'll give up our appetite for despair, and we will taste and know of delight. And we will become bread for a hungering world, and we'll become drink for those who thirst, and the blessed will become the blessing, and everywhere will be the feast. And the blessed will become the blessing, and everywhere in central Alberta will be the feast. So I'd like you to stand with me. I'm going to worship in a minute. But I thought it would be good just to take a moment, if you're in, that we could dedicate our homes to the Lord. And a couple of, just a couple of words uh, before I pray. Um, there's a place in Acts 17 where it says, From one man, God made every nation a people. And he determined beforehand where they should live, uh, the times in which they should live. So today, instead of the 1800s, and then it gets right down, it says, and the exact places where they should live. I don't know if you realize that your, your condo, your basement suite, your dorm, your house, your apartment, whatever, uh, that is the exact place God determined that you should live, which assumes that he determined that we would live by these people and in this neighborhood and not that one. And so I think it's appropriate to recognize that and to say to the Father, this place that you determined I should live in, I want it to be your place. I want it to be a place of your presence and your peace. And there's another place in the Bible where it says that, and every good and perfect gift comes from him. We are not self-made people. We're not. Everything we have is gift. These homes that we live in, however they are, they're from him. And so what we're doing tonight is just in an intentional way, just saying back to him, thank you for this gift of a place. And Father, I want your will to be done and your name known in this place. So I'm just going to pray. And if you're in, why don't you just lift your hand? No, you don't have to feel embarrassed if you don't want to, but we're all going to be praying and, and we won't notice. But if you want to commit your house to the Lord, just lift your hand like this and, and we'll pray and just ask the Lord to take these and use them for his kingdom. Father in heaven, I thank you that a long time ago you determined the exact places that we should live and the exact street, the exact neighborhoods. Um, Father, I thank you for this gift. Sometimes we wish we had more and we get covetous, but tonight we just want to say thank you because we have more than most of the whole world has. And recognizing that you gave us our homes, we just want to say to you tonight that we commit them to you. We dedicate them to you. We want them to be places of your presence. Lord, as people come and go, would they sense there's something different about the people that live here. There's something different about this place. There's peace here. Father, I, I pray that, that you would bring many, many people to Jesus Christ in central Alberta, even through our homes. We, we're, we're, some of us do this well, and not, not me, but a lot of people do this well, and some of us are just, we're raw novices at this, but we trust you to teach us. If we give it to you, we know that you'll know how to use it. So tonight we commit them to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.